Welcome to Wingman. For those of you uh, watching on the uh, internet, we welcome you and uh, we're glad you have the opportunity to come. We'd like to say a, give a warm Wingman welcome to our uh, Fairview Element Group. And uh, and again, we are very blessed to have our uh, our very own Dudley Hall, our spiritual mentor. So without uh, further ado, please give Dudley a warm wingman welcome. Well, thanks guys. Good to be with you guys again. We had a wonderful retreat out at Tesoro Escondido. We got some guys who are wearing the right hat, we got the TE hat on. So you can wear several hats here. I will say that it was a fun time. Uh, the uh, hog toss champion still resides in the <laughs> wingman here. He, he did have quite a challenge from one of the young men over at the uh, Fairview deal. But, uh, and I will say this, uh, Chad still has some competitive fires. I, you know, it, it was fun to watch him get all bowed up there and start pacing around and all that kind of stuff. You know. <laughs> Uh, I will say that, that uh, Bob is one of the worst sports I've ever, ever, ever seen. He, he gets a little bit ahead in bocce ball and, and just goes crazy. Uh, starts talking trash. It's just uh, no Christian would act like that. For those of you who are not able to attend, I hope you will the next one we do. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Uh, weather was great. Fellowship was fabulous. Uh, competition was good. A lot of great uh, camaraderie, guys talking to each other and talking to God. It, it was a great time. How many of you were there? How many of you got to go? Yeah. Uh, well, as soon as we get one on the, on the calendar, put it down. It'll be worth you uh, pushing other things around to, to make that. I want to say a word about the book that we were talking about a little while ago. Uh, so often now, running into people who are saying, hey, my, my friend just came to know the Lord, or I have a man who's a young Christian that's just started uh, relating to us, and uh, what can you put in our hands that would help us get started? So I looked at the materials that were available, and uh, being very picky, I didn't like any of them totally, so I made my own. So uh, for right now, this is what I believe. I could change, but for right now, this is it. This is just a basic... Uh, what, how do you get started in the Christian faith? And it's a format where you can actually take it and work through it like a workbook, but it would be great to work through with a buddy. Here are the questions we deal with. Why do we need to place faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord? Number two, how do we come to faith in Jesus? Number three, what happens when we put our faith in Jesus? Number four, how are we to live now that we're followers of the living Lord? Number five, what is spiritual warfare? Number six, what does spiritual transformation look like? And then there's some recommended resources. And uh, as I said, there are questions in here that you can an answer as you read through the scriptures. If you get totally locked up and you go, I don't know how to answer that question after you've thought with your great intelligence, you can actually go online and I, I answered them for you. But uh, I didn't want to make it so easy that you wouldn't think through it. Anyway, what I recommend, what I'm doing is I keep two or three of these in my briefcase so I'm in my truck, because when you run into a guy, it's, uh, you know, and say, well, call my office. You know, they never do. So uh, I recommend that you get some of these from the office and keep them uh, close at hand, because it'll be a great tool in your effort to help your, your buddies and those who are walking with you. And we'll have some here at Wingman that we'll make available for guys. Okay. Uh, Oftentimes, when I come to speak at Wingman, I feel like I am supposed to uh, kind of give a prophetic type word, that is a, a kind of a proclamation that <clears throat> uh, 
uh, makes a distinction between black and white, uh, right and wrong, absolutes and the non-absolutes and whatever, uh, because that needs to be done. We, we men like to stand on truth. We, we know that there's a lot of cultural stuff going on that's really not, not it. And, uh, but today, I felt like I was supposed to talk to you from a pastoral point of view. Uh, I, I want to talk to you because I think God is doing something in our midst with all the focus on tragedy right now, with the whole thing that just happened in the Boston Marathon, the explosion in West Texas, which for those not in Texas, that's always confusing, like West Texas, like, yeah, well, there's a place called West Texas. Uh, the, uh, the girls that were just discovered who'd been kidnapped 10 years ago and kept where they never got out of the house, wars in Syria, Afghanistan, all, all the focus on tragedy, and uh, I, I hear so little about how to, how to handle that, how to face that. So I want to talk to you about that, because tragedy doesn't always have to make the news for it to hurt. Tragedy comes in all shapes and sizes. Tragedy for you can be losing a job. It can be a wife that says, I've had it, and she's gone. It can be a child who rebels against everything you've ever taught or loved or believed. It can be an accident. It can be going to the doctor and getting a diagnosis you were not expected. Uh, tragedy can, can hit anywhere. And uh, I don't know any of us that have not face tragedy. And, and it's important if we are going to be reflectors of God in this society for us to know how do we face it. There are a lot who would like to try to avoid it. Well, uh, yeah, if possible, but on the other hand, good luck. Uh, tragedy it seems to be a part of this fallen world. And I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. I'd like to begin, however, by reading a passage of Scripture. I could pick many, but this is Psalm 46. This is always an encouraging text for me. And so if you brought a Bible, get it out. If not, it's on the screen, and it says this. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with its turmoil. There's a river, its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He burns up the chariots. Stop your fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Uh, it's a hard thing to believe sometimes that when things are going awry and you've just been kicked in the stomach maybe for more than one time and all the breath is out that God really is in charge. Uh, and that he can be trusted, and that he is that he is good. Uh, tragedy has some commonalities, though it always takes different forms in our lives. One commonality of it is that it's never wanted. You never wake up in the morning and go, "Oh man, I hope I have a tragedy today." <laughs> it's uh, it's always an invader. It always involves loss. It's uh, it's discombobulating. It, it usually surprises us. It, uh, one of the big things for, for us men, since we all know that experience, is 
it destabilizes us. It, it, it re exposes to us again the reality that we're really not in charge. That with all of our best plans and every boundary that we can put in place, that there are some things beyond our control and the explanation of them beyond our understanding. Uh, so, some use this, uh, use tragedy to be a, a time when they look for chinks in God's nature. Like, well, if God were good and big, he wouldn't allow such terrible abuse and so forth. And usually that's because uh, if we can find a chink in God's nature, it gives us an excuse not to have to deal with him when he uh, demands that we love him with all of our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. Uh, the, uh, one of the negative things that I, I see happening to us, and it's always a temptation, is to let tragedy and its effects become an identifying marker for us. Uh, I, I've, I know people who, because of a tragedy that's happened in their life, that's who they are. They are a victim of that tragedy. I'm thinking of a lady that I, I know who lost her husband 20 years ago in a tragic accident. In a, he was a great man and a great teacher of men, and his airplane flew into the side of a mountain. And she's, uh, she wasn't expecting it. It kicked her in the stomach. It, it devastated her life. Nothing was the same again. Uh, but that's who she is in her mind. She's a victim of that. God mishandled that in her mind. Like, why did this happen to me? I am a widow. I, am, I have been victimized. Uh, we all know a folk like that. And it's always a temptation for us. The, uh, the whole Jewish culture has had to deal with that issue of defining itself in terms of the Holocaust, of, of, of being victimized and, and so forth. The, uh, but it's, it can be true of a, of a minority. It can be true of any of us, actually. Uh, you may have heard of the man who uh, survived the Johnstown flood. He, uh, he was one of few that su survived it, and it was a terrible uh, event. And he, it was the biggest thing that ever happened in his life, and so it became his story. And the problem was nobody wanted to hear his story because he took so long telling it, and he gloried in it so much. And uh, if you saw him coming, you just kind of want to get away because he took forever to tell his story of surviving the Johnstown flood. So... Finally, he dies and gets to the pearly gates, and uh, Peter welcomes him in and says, uh, okay, you're in heaven now. Is there anything in particular that would make you happy? Anything on earth that you felt like you were shortchanged in that right now could be a fulfillment? He said, yes, absolutely. He said, oh, I, I, I survived the Johnstown flood, and, and nobody has ever been willing to listen to me tell my whole story, and I want to tell my story. And so Peter said, well, I think we can handle that. He said, we're having a meeting tonight, and everybody will be there, and I'll put you on the program, and you can tell your story. And let's see, you'll be speaking right after Noah. <laughs> uh, Tragedy can be so staggering that it, it, it discombobulates us, and we, we think that's weakness, but actually it isn't. Tra tragedy demands of us, if we're ever going to get through it and embrace it for what it is, it, it demands honesty. Uh, we men have been taught to say, no problem, I, I can make it, no, no, no big deal, I'll, I'll get through. But you know, when you hurt, you hurt, and it's okay to say you hurt. Instead of suppressing it, denying it, and whatever, it just, you heard, well, I'm a Christian, and so, praise God, all things work together for those who love the Lord, or those who call to God. Okay, all that's true. You are a Christian, and that's, that scripture is true. But you know what? When you hurt, 
you just heard. I've been through some tough times where I had well-meaning friends to say to me, oh, Dudley, this is going to turn out to be such a great ministry. When you come out of this, you're going to have a message. And it's like, you know, honestly, I don't give a rip. I, I don't want ministry right now. I want things to return to normal. I want my belly to quit hurting. I want, I want circumstances to go back to some kind of normalcy so I can get a handle on it. I, I don't care. The whole world can go to hell right now as, as, as my feelings go. So, so I, I don't need to be reminded that it'll be a minute. Yeah, will it? Yes, I know. It'll become a part of our story. It'll become a, 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 an episode that we can talk about the grace of God. Yes. But when you're hurting, you're not looking for a, an emerging ministry. It's a good word to those of us who try to help our buddies through that. It's a good word for us ourselves to, to just know it's all right. Uh, to tell God, I don't like this. Don't know why you're doing this. Uh, it hurts and I want it to go away. But in the middle of that, there comes the questions of why. That seems to be always the issue, doesn't it? Let me give you a little statement that I read somewhere that I've adopted. Knowing why helps. It does. But knowing him heals. That's more than just a trite little statement if you'll, if you'll get into it. You see, uh, if we really want to know from the big perspective why, the answer is God is absolutely committed to exposing all of himself to us. Another way of saying that is, God is absolutely committed to revealing his glory in all of its fullness to us. Now again, when you're in the middle of hurt, you're going, I don't want God's glory, I just want some relief. But you need to know, and I need to know, that God is into more than making life comfortable and controllable and reasonable and manageable. Uh, he is into making life beautiful. And his glory is so fabulous that he is unwilling for us to settle for those things in life that bring us some level of satisfaction but do not render to us the ultimate level of fulfillment that comes when we see his glory. Uh, There are those who would say that the uh, first thing you ought to do when tragedy happens is find out who was wrong here. Is this a punishment from God? That's always uh, frustrating to me and amusing to me when, when, when big tragedies happen that, that we know about. Somebody. Like Katrina, for instance. I heard so many, particularly prophets and whatever, saying, Katrina, that's God's judgment on New Orleans for being a wicked city. Well, my response to that is if that's true, God's a bad shot. <laughs> you know, he missed Bourbon Street and hit the Ninth Ward. Uh, don't be so quick to determine that this is God's punishment on someone or some group of people or some segment or whatever because because of wickedness. I, I want to remind you of something as Christians. <clears throat> Jesus took the punishment. He took the wrath of God. Uh, which means God is not anxious to throw his wrath down on the earth. Jesus stood between us and wrath. Which means that Jesus uh, is in charge of us and whatever happens in our life is not for the it's not for the purpose of shaming you and punishing you and putting you down and condemning you and casting you out with a sense of I failed it. It's all about uh, revealing himself to you and bringing you along so that you will discover his glory. For those who don't trust Jesus, the punishment is because they've rejected that solution and they get what they want. They didn't want God and they didn't want Jesus, so that's what they get. Uh, there was a group 
back in Jesus' day who came to him and they said, hey, you know that deal that happened over here in Galilee where Pilate actually took some of the Jews that were over there who were making sacrifices and he took them and killed them and put them on the altar too and mixed them with the sacrifices and made fun of them. Uh, what kind of punishment is going to come on those? And what about that tower that fell that killed 18 people over there? It, isn't that God punishing people? And Jesus essentially said, no, but uh, you need to repent or you will all perish. In other words, what he was saying is the issue is Jesus. The issue is your response to Jesus, not all, all about that other stuff. So I, I just want to encourage you in the midst of your own personal tragedy or public tragedy or national tragedy or whatever, don't be so quick to determine this is a direct cause of sin of, of what, whatever. You, you'll miss the point if you do. The other thing I, I warn against is when tragedy happens and it gets beyond our understanding, our tendency is to conclude that God is uninvolved. Uh, you know, it's a, it, the answer that seems to want to protect God's reputation is, well, God set this thing in order and he put rules there and order there, and if you violate the order, these bad things are going to happen. It's, don't blame God. Don't blame God about this whole deal. Blame man. Blame sin, the devil. Blame sin. But don't blame God because he's uninvolved. You just, you're just working out a, a, a mechanistic system here, and if you make choices, bad things happen, so don't, don't blame God. Uh, don't go that far, guys. God doesn't need his reputation uh, defended in that way. Uh, he is absolutely involved. I've heard people say, I don't want to live in a world where God lets babies die. I don't want to live in a world where God's not in charge of everything. So uh, j just don't go there if you want to experience this whole thing. So uh, It's a part of the, the, the uh, revealing of God's glory. Uh, God's original purpose for creating man was to display his glory. Uh, I know that word can be, it can be such a biblical word, it can become uh, kind of a religious shibboleth type thing, glory. What does glory mean? Glory is the outworking or the expression or the display of the true nature of something. Uh, someone has said, it's God's beauty going public. There, there are little shadows of it in the Old Testament. God showed up for Israel in a pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, guided them. Uh, he filled the Holy of Holies with his Shekinah glory. Uh, Isaiah saw the Lord in a day of tragedy. The tragedy for Isaiah was that the king, King Uzziah, had died. He was a good king. And... Uh, he had died and some bad things were about to happen. In the midst of that, Isaiah saw the Lord and when he saw the glory of the Lord, he fell and he encountered God and got up totally changed because he saw the glory of the Lord. All those are just little flashes, just little flashlight flickers of the glory of God. But when Jesus came, he began to unveil the glory of God. The beauty of God began to come forth. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that in the greatest tragedy that history has ever known, the one that makes all other tragedies pale in comparison, the day when the only perfect man who was ever on the earth faced the abuse, the injustice, the cruelty of the whole religious system of the whole world and the civil deception of, of government, both Rome and and Judaism was allied against him and all the forces of hell. And so injustice and hatred and bitterness and everything culminated at this point where Jesus was tried. And yet if you listen to Jesus talk about it, it wasn't a tragedy at all. In his last discourse with his disciples, just before all of this began to happen, John 14 through 17, Jesus prays just before the betrayal, just before all this begins to happen. Listen to what he says. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. See, Jesus saw what we would call the greatest tragedy 
anybody that would be honest, the greatest tragedy that has ever happened in creation. He saw it as a time when God begins and continues to unfold his beauty. There are those who are highly impressed with creation. You know, it's like, well, I don't, the Bible and all that stuff's not important, going to church and Jesus. And all. What I like is nature, just looking at nature. I, hey, me too. But, but nature is just the window dressing around the real beauty of the glory of God. If you're, if you're impressed with that, you ought to see the incarnation. You ought to see almighty, sovereign God becoming a man, living in the limitations of man, suffering as man, representing man on the earth, uh, demonstrating what true love is, releasing a love like the world had never known before. Man had known affectionate love. He had known filial love, love amongst the brothers. He, he had known eros love, romantic, passionate love. But he'd never seen anything like this. This love that Jesus expressed, that he was, that he demonstrated on the earth. Uh, nobody's ever seen beauty like that, that kind of love. You know, I mean, if you're impressed with power, you know, look at the crucifixion where Jesus is being tried by Rome and by Israel, and, he, and he's there, and, and Pilate says to him, so you're a king, are you? And, and Jesus basically said, you say so. Uh, uh, oh, well, what kind of king are you? Well, he said, I, my kingdom did not originate in this world, but since we're talking about it, yes, I am a king. And uh, so Pilate can't believe it. He can't believe this guy says he's a king. And finally Jesus said, for this purpose I was born and have come to testify of the truth. Now what was happening there was the greatest transfer of authority in all of the universe because Jesus, get this guys, this is good. Jesus as last Adam was taking back over the kingship that Adam gave up in the garden and as Adam, he was becoming king again over everything God had assigned to man to begin with, to subdue the earth. And at that moment, Pilate judged himself, judged Rome, judged every uh, authority that would ever exist because this was the moment in history when that stone came rolling down the mountain and crushed all the powers of government. Remember that, remember that vision that, that Daniel had? Well, act like you do for just a second. Daniel had this, <laughs> Daniel had this vision back when, when Israel was in Babylonian captivity and, and he saw this stone rolling down the mountain. It was a stone cut out without hands. It hadn't been hewn. But, and, and it rolled down the mountain and there was the, the statue representing all the kingdoms of the world. It had represented Babylon as the head and, and then the, uh, the Persia as the shoulders and then Greek, Greece as the middle part and then Rome and and this stone comes down and crushes them all and establishes the kingdom of God's people on the earth forever. And all through the years, the Jews had looked forward to the day when that stone would come rolling down the mountain, but they thought it was going to happen in a military way with swords and spears and political power and whatever. And it all happened one day when Pilate said, so you're a king. And Jesus said, yes, I'm a king. And the truth stands before you. And Pilate couldn't handle the truth. And when he said, what is truth? He revealed he had no idea because he was standing face to face with ultimate unveiled truth. And he judged himself and he judged Rome and Rome fell. Just like Caiaphas had judged Jesus previously, but he really wasn't judging Jesus. Jesus was judging him and Israel fell. It was destroyed in 70 AD. So you want to talk about power authority, look at the cross. You want to talk about power, look at the resurrection. The Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. You want to talk about authority and power, look at the ascension. Jesus was ascended to the right hand of the Father and sits there today ruling over everything the Father owns, which means to us, brothers, nothing gets through to us that doesn't come through the hand of Jesus, who is the ultimate shepherd and so whatever gets through to us has love written all over it. 
It's not that mamby-pamby kind of love that we got out of Hollywood or that we learned in the backseat of a car somewhere. It's none of that kind of love. It's the kind of love that's tough, the kind of love that calls us into seeing a glory beyond ourselves, that causes us to live in a self-giving life rather than a self-sustaining, self-surviving life. So, so looking at Jesus is the... Uh, is the real issue. So, so God is not, he loves you too much. He loves me too much to let us be satisfied with nice cars and nice houses and orderly lives and everything working well. And he loves you too much for that. There's way too much glory to be seen in order for God to let that to keep happening. So he gives us those times in our life when everything is destabilized so that in it we discover there's another depth of grace that I haven't seen yet. And when we see it, we're enamored. See, when you see the true light, those lesser lights become less enticing. When you see real pleasure, those lesser pleasures become less enticing. So that's how God transforms us. He transforms us by allowing things, creating things, leading us into things in our life that destroy the lesser so we can have the greater. And by the way, that's as simple as it gets. The scripture says, uh, we're changed from one degree of glory to another as we behold the glory of God. That's another thing that's bothersome to us. We want to do something. And God says, uh, well, all I want you to do is just look. Just look. What did they have to, do, have to do in the wilderness when they were being bitten by snakes and dying of the poison of snakes? And Moses put a serpent on the pole and he said, what should we do? Look. Just look. Well, that's way too simple. I'm not going to do that. So you're going to die of a snake bite simply because you won't look. Yeah, that's way too simple. Look. So Jesus was put on the pole, the cross, and held up. And I'm going to tell you today, if you're going to get transformed ever, if you're ever going to be changed from being just a good American Christian that controls everything, if you're going to move into the real glory and to, and to real intimacy, you've got to look. L look at him. Uh, in fact, what, what I would say as I close with this is that real, real living, real Christian living, real living in any form, which has to be Christian living. Real living can be defined in this. I'm, I want to read it so I may get it, make sure I get it right. Real living is in loving dependence upon a living Savior whose, whose beauty satisfies our every longing. I'm going to read it again. I want one comment. Real living is lived in loving dependence upon a living Savior whose beauty satisfies our every longing. There's a sense in which we think when things are not going well that God as Savior will come and, and fix things so that we can get back to our independent, isolated living. I have addictions, I have problems. God fix it. Fix it so I don't have that anymore. Well, God's design is not to fix you so you don't need him. It's to fix you so you do need him. Real health is living in absolute, total dependence, loving dependence upon a living, conscious Savior that when you see him, his beauty satisfies every longing. That's real life. And if you're going for anything else, then you'll be disappointed in life because tragedies will kick the breath out of you. But if you're walking in this kind of life, tragedies, though they're painful, though we would never invite them, tragedies simply give us an opportunity to see the veil peel back a little more, to see the glory of God. And the more of the glory of God we see, the more transformed we become and the less susceptible to the temptation of lesser gods we are. So, brothers, you're not a victim of life. 
You're not a victim of a God who said he was loved but isn't. You're not a victim of a powerless God. You're not a victim of a deist God who simply set things into operation and left. You are a son of the living God where he is absolutely committed to you. Now before I close, I want to ask this. If you've been kicked in the gut in recent days and you've been walking through a tragedy, your tragedy, and you're hurting right now and you, you just need a touch from God. I wonder, would you just lift your hand? I want to pray for you. Just hold your hand up. Keep it up. And I want the brothers around you to lay a hand on you. Okay, all you guys around, get so you can lay a hand on you. you. Keep your hand up until somebody's got a hand on you. And now, Holy Father, I thank you that you have never gone to sleep on the job. I thank you that you you've not turned your back on your children, on your sons, because we've done something wrong, because we violated your order. I thank you that you've taken care of that in the Lord Jesus and that you are actively involved in our life. And for these, our brothers that are admitting today they've been kicked in the belly by circumstances in life, I ask you to make the living Savior real to them. I pray that Jesus would not just be a historical figure that died on a cross, was raised from the grave, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. But to today, your Holy Spirit would make Jesus a real, comforting shepherd, the life, the wisdom, the love, the passion. I pray that you would restore to every one of these hearts a sense that you are in charge, though we aren't, and that you can be trusted even when we can't get a grip on things. I ask you, Father, to make your healing real. Would you cause from the innermost beings of these men a cry to go out to you, Abba, Father, that you are still our Father, you still care, and that you're willing to meet us in this, walk with us through this, and eventually open our eyes to see that your beauty is more important than whatever it was we had before. And I pray that you would cause this to happen in every man who's acknowledging pain today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for your support of Wingman Ministries. We would love to hear your comments about today's show and help you get connected with other men in your local area. To keep up to date on upcoming events, element groups, and speakers, please visit our website at wingman.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our email list.